Aloha, thank you for joining. I want to make this video to honor the memory of Elder Malido Masone, but also to bring awareness towards our ancestors. Today is full moon in Leo, and uh, for um, in Indian astrology, it's a uh, full moon in Maga. Um, which rules the ancestors and I think uh, specifically the uh, masculine lineage. Um, I've been wanting to talk about the work of Elder Malido Masome for some time and I thought it, this, this was a great opportunity to do it as he talks so much about ancestralization and healing and community. So I only knew about Elder um, Marido Masome very recently. I heard about him before. Uh, I knew a little about his work. Um, but it was in December, at the beginning of December, when I read the news about his death. And when I saw a picture of him on my Instagram feed, um, it immediately got my attention and it made me very emotional to know about his death. Um, and I light a candle uh, in his name and that same day I started reading his books and I keep reading them. <laughs> Uh, I think that once you start reading one of his books, you, you can put it down. Um, so the first one I read was uh, Of Water and the, Spirit, and the Spirit, where he talks about his journey. Um, from being a child in a Dadara tribe. Um, this is in what today is Burkina Faso in Africa, uh, West Africa, and um, he talks about his um, very close connection with his grandfather, who was a, a spiritual leader of his community, and all the magic he performed, um, and about the death of his uh, grandfather and this amazing beautiful uh, death rituals uh, he witnessed it um, and how he's kidnapped by a Jesuit priest and he goes through an incredible amount of emotional and physical abuse um, he is forced to learn French and to learn about Western culture um, uh, among many other child um, forbidden to speak his language to the point that he, he forgot to speak it um, and I think when he's around 12 years he's um, he goes to um, Jesuit um, seminar um, in the city uh, where he once again has to struggle with a lot of abuse, cruelty, brainwashing. Uh, I have to say that reading those pages was very, very difficult. Uh, I wanted to end. <laughs> I, want to I wanted those chapters to end because it was very, very uh, hard to, to read uh, about his experiences. Um, At one point, he, around his 20s, he has had enough 
um, it has this very violent reaction towards uh, systematic abuse from the priest. Um, he escapes and he walks towards his stride, uh, not knowing what he was going to find there, if, if he was going to find anything. He finds his family, he finds his tribe. Um, but he's seen a bit as, as a stranger. For his tribe, he, he has known the medicine of the white man and he's not the same. In fact, they see, the, they see him as a danger for the community. It's a danger because he knows how to read and how to write and he knows another language, the language of the white man and that's very... they find it very dangerous and they find uh, to be a very... Um, powerful magic um, so the, there is this struggle if he should stay or if in fact, he must stay with the white man. Um, but some of the elders think that he has a very important purpose and he needs to be initiated. Which in the tribe usually happens around 14 years old. He's 20. He does not as longer speak the language. There is a lot of things he doesn't understand from the community and most importantly his way of his way of experiencing uh, nature and reality has changed he has this analytic mind that he was taught about in the in the school system of the white man um, he learned to analyze, he learned about philosophy, and that's the way um, he thinks about the world. He has lost uh, touch with nature, with the cycles of nature. Um, he's in linear time also, which is very different from his tribe that does not experience time in the same way. So he was a stranger in the Western world, and now he's a stranger in his tribe. And through the book, you can feel that the grieving feeling. Um, so he goes through that initiation. Those chapters are really, really amazing. Um, he doesn't share everything because there is a lot of sacredness uh, within those rites that cannot be shared. Uh, but everything he shares is so powerful and moving. Um, so, um, his name, well, it, within the tribe, um, it's known that everybody comes with a purpose. And it's uh, a task for the community to support the child to pursue that, that purpose. So uh, when the mother is pregnant, she goes into trance and the community asks to the child in the womb uh, what is his purpose and how the community can help him to fulfill that. Um, the name they, they pick for the child is goes along that purpose and for Elder Malidoma Sume, Malidoma means to make friends with the enemy. 
And he has, his grandfather told him when he was a little boy that he, in a way, he was meant to be a bridge between uh, the African culture and the Western culture. And that brought him a lot of challenges. Um, he talks more about in other in other books, and and I want to share some of the quotes. So that was the first book I read. And then I read about uh, ritual healing and community, and I'm reading right now um, the healing wisdom of Africa. Also. We are in February, this is the Black Month History Month and that's another reason why I wanted to make this video now. Um, well, when I was reading the book, um, I could relate so much <laughs> to what, what he was going through. Also, my case is very different, I am, I am white <laughs> and and I was not kidnapped, um, but I, I I went to a Catholic to Catholic schools. Uh, I was raised Catholic. Um, when I was eight years old, I was very interested on philosophy and uh, metaphysics. Um, and when I was twelve. 15, Fifteen. I was reading about Freud. I was reading about psychology, and so, so, sociology, anthropology. Uh, those were the things that interested me, um, and I was very interested on the indigenous world. Um, and I thought that they had a wisdom that we needed to listen more to. But it took me many, many years to understand that I was, I was seeing the indigenous world from the white view, the white perspective, uh, which is um, there is prejudices that get in the way of truly uh, understanding their their way of living. Um, there is this, this quote among the Dagara, darkness is sacred, it is forbidden to illuminate it, for light scares the spirit away, or night is the day of the spirit and of the ancestors who come to tell, who come to us to tell us what lies on our life path. To have light around you is like saying that you will rather ignore this wonderful opportunity to be shown the way. I love that. Darkness is sacred and it's forbidden to illuminate it. And it, well, he's talking about a physical light, like he talks about how he needed when he goes back to the tribe, how he needed to have a light during the night while everybody else uh, was used to have no kind of light in the rooms um, and the, even they look for dark rooms with a very small window but it when I was reading it remind me how we often talk about illuminating the shadow bringing in the shadow into the light like everything has to be light everything has to be illuminated um, but darkness is precious too, or shadows are precious too. We don't not we don't need to bring them to the light. Um, it's more like we need to honor them as they are. It's like that dark room is supposed to stay dark. It has a purpose for it to be in the darkness. It's just we must get used, or eyes must get used to. To that darkness. It was just something that came to me. And when he talks about 
um, there were all many many different parts in in that book of water and spirit and the other books where he talks about view uh, of the western world and the problems of whiteness um one of the one of the elders tells him the spirit that animates the whites is extremely restless and powerful when it comes to keeping that restlessness alive wherever he goes he brings a new order the order of unrest it keeps him always tense and uneasy but that's the only way he can exist the white man is not strong he's a scare he's consumed by his terror and restless with it to stay alive until his peace he is at peace with himself, no one around him ever will be. So the elders understood that, uh, Elder Malidoma was bringing, bringing that awareness of the illness of the white man. He, he, he was carrying that illness himself. Um, he was making his community aware that they could not close themselves to the Western world, that in, in one way or another, it will reach them to that illness. Um, and it's interesting how they say that um, they talk about the restlessness um, when I read about ADHD, for example, uh, or all of the anxiousness that people from the Western uh, experience, and for what uh, we read about or we know about the indigenous communities, it's very strange for them. I mean, those that really stay still stay in that kind of life uh, really connected with nature there is no that restlessness there is no that need to hurry um, they live in a different pace and there is another part where he talks about The, the white man and the connection with uh, this is was another another shaman he, he was talking about the problem of the, of the westerners we Africans also believe that we need healing at the hand of the white man. This is why our children leave us. You see, it's the same world, the same house. When someone is sick, everyone is. Why should we remain pay passive while the white man searches the world for the means to save himself? We are together in this struggle. All our souls need rest in a safe home. All people must heal because we are all sick. So for not well, not everybody in the tribe agreed, <clears throat> but the the wise ones could, could see how they were mirroring each other and how the white man was looking for for healing in Africa and this is something that and there is um, this beautiful video on YouTube um, Malidoma, uh, Elder Malidoma speaking about healing and community and he was speaking that 
he knew that children will go back to Africa, will come back to Africa, and he didn't know how or why, but it was something that he knew. Um, a very beautiful woman that uh, does one of the most beautiful lay <laughs> language I have ever heard sent me this, this lay language song and I had many visions while I listened to it and one of the one of the visions it was well how Africa is the is the root you know of the world well energetically Africa represents um, the root of the world as, as the chakra Africa would be the root and years ago and, and with the same lady when we were singing together I had the vision of we were all this tree you know and Africa was the root of the tree um, and the only way for us for us all to grow strong and tall if it's the, the roots were strong and nurture it. And in these new visions I had, um, it's like in, the, in Africa was planted the seed of humanity. So I'm not talking about genetically or biologically. Well, I would say biologically. Um, because uh, many researchers say that humanity um, began in Africa. So even if we are white, if we go back to the very, very beginning of humanity, of humanity our first ancestors uh, were Africans. So when the children must go back to Africa, I, I think that we are all the children we are all children of Africa, and we are all called, um, sorry, <laughs> whenever I feel very emotional about something is uh, for me a sign that I'm, I'm tapping into a very deep truth, um, and I can feel uh, like ancestors saying, yes, yes. Is it time to go back to Africa? And and I think this month, uh, Black History Month, is, is a very good opportunity to do that, to read about the story of Africa, about his heritage, um, about their their leaders, um, and the spiritual teachings of Africa that are often forgotten. Um, So when I was uh, listening to that like, language song, I, I could feel like Africa as this big mother calling us home. So as we go back to Africa, uh, our heritage, we also must be aware of our ancestors. And their guidance. And so we can heal together. We can heal each other. By becoming aware of what unites us. that how did this in fact the same home mm. one of the things uh, uh, Elder Malido Masome talks a lot about is about grief the healing power of grief and pain 
this quote, a body in pain is a soul in longing. To shut down the pain is to override the call of the soul. The Dagara elders believe that a person who has suffered is a person who has heard the pain. The person hears the pain as a creative action, connecting that person with his or her higher self, which prescribes an alternative to a spiritual death. So pain at least teaches something. It's commotion, emotion, and a call for a rebirth. So instead of say, uh, seeing pain as uh, this burden or this symptom that must be um, must be cured for them. It's, it's this, this sign, this language of the body telling us that our soul needs needs something, needs to fulfill that, that original purpose. And the importance of ritual that Elder Malidoma talks a lot in his books, ritual draws from this area of human existence where the spirit plays a life-giving role. We do not make miracles, we speak the kind of language that is interpreted by the supernatural world as a call to intervene in a stabilizing way in a particular life. Consequently, our role in ritual is to be human. We take the initiative to spark a process, knowing that its, it's success is not in our hands but in the hands of the kind forces we invoke into our lives. So the forced feel we create within a ritual is something coming from the spirit, not something coming from us. We are only instrument in, his kind, in this kind of interaction between dimensions, between realms. And this reminds me a lot of Ho'oponopono, because in Ho'oponopono, some people think, Okay, I'm doing this, I'm cleaning in this experience, I want to clean in this illness or something like that. And we don't do we don't do anything. <laughs> well in, in Haponopono we are asking a petition to divinity. And divinity knows what's best for us, what memory needs to be clean. Um so in Hoponopono Hoponopono is like saying uh I don't know. And I surrender. I let go. And I ask to divinity to clean this. Um, and, I, and, I, and I like the idea that our role in ritual is to be human. <laughs> Uh, sometimes people see shamans as spiritual leaders as these super powerful supernatural beings. Um, some of them believe that uh, and they get they go through the wrong path and and I like more that go into the humble space where we do not do the healing, we, we just the conduit. We just make that petition, that prayer, that ritual, so divinity um, has a space. We make a space for divinity, in a way, to act in our lives. And also, uh, he talks a lot about the importance of community. A true community begins in the hearts of the people involved. It's not a place of distraction, but a place of being. It is not a place where you reform, but a place you go home to. Finding a home is what people in community try and accomplish. In community, it's possible to restore a supportive presence for one another. The others in community are the reason that one feels the way one feels. The elder cannot be an elder if there is no community to make him an elder. The young boy cannot feel secure if there is no elder who 
whose silent presence gives him hope in life. The adult cannot be who he is unless there is a strong sense of presence of the other people around. This interdependency is what I call supportive presence. So I have always struggled with the sense of community. Um, I always been used to be alone, to learn by my own. Um, I have a hard time spending time with other people, connecting with other people, making friends, socializing. It's not not really my thing. Um, so I have always wondered, well, where is my community? But we're always, even if we don't interact, there are people present in my life, one way or another. And online, it's also, there is also community there. Um, so how, how I am? in the presence of others and how I could not be who I am without that, without that presence. And so I've been wondering how can I, how can I give back to my community? Their presence um, has taught me many things. They have shared, people have shared things in my life in different ways. How can I give back? To that, to that giving, I've been wondering about that. And he he talk, he talks about the characteristics of a community. There is, you know, unity of the spirit. They feel like a cell in a body. There's trust. There's no sense of discrimination or elitism. There is openness. Individual problems quickly become community problems. There is love and caring. There is respect for the elders and respect for nature. And there is the cult of the ancestors. The ancestors are not dead. That's something that we often forget. Spirits are not dead. They live in the spirits of, in the community. They, they are reborn into the trees, the mountains, the rivers, and the stones to guide and inspire the community. So it, it goes hand in hand in the respect for nature and the culture for the ancestors because they are, in fact, um, the same. <laughs> When he was talking about pain and grief, he also talked. Uh, he uh, he found interesting how um, in the Western world there is this need to hold emotions. Like even in funerals, people do not want to cry. At least in North America, South America is a bit different. Most in some countries. Most, more than others, uh, but this very uh, formal funerals um, <coughs> and how we avoid talking about death. Um, they, he says, there are countless, countless ways of expressing emotion because countless ways are needed. No one is supposed to repress emotion. If death disturbs the living. It offers a unique opportunity to unleash one of the strongest emotional powers humans have. The power to grief. And this is this is really beautiful. People who do not know who do not know how to weep together are people who cannot laugh together. <clears throat> people who know not the power of shedding tears together are like a time bomb. 
dangerous to themselves and to the world around them. Grief for the Dagara, grief is seen as food for the psyche, just as the body needs food, the psyche needs grief to maintain its own healthy balance. He also talks about how the death need or grief they need or tears in order to be able to to go in his in their journeys and I found that very very beautiful many times well, um, some of you know that I have another channel uh, where I channel um, artists um, I, I, I call them the wild ones I said this soul group of artists um, many times um, I have tapped into them as individuals and I start crying and crying and many times I felt bad about that like why I'm crying if I never knew them um, like it makes more sense if if I listen to their music or or I admire them as actors sometimes I don't even know them or it's the first time I know about them and start crying and when I was involved into online groups where there was this very strong <laughs> um, oh, how do I say influence of the new age some people it's not like they would judge you but in a way they would judge you if you cry or if you even if you grieve I remember people posting about you shouldn't shouldn't grieve or I would post about death and people would say uh, but but death is just um, um, you can still communicate with them you know it's like they would minimize death in a way and they would find grief as as if you don't understand that life goes on and of course i understand that life goes on i, I have those experiences of connecting with the spirit beyond death but doesn't mean doesn't take away the fact that i'm grieving for them it doesn't mean that um I appreciate them less now they are dead. Um, so when I read that, <laughs> it was like, okay, it, it was okay. <laughs> and then I, I cried so many times. Um, for example, I follow this beautiful um, page on Instagram and dedicated to the people that pass by AIDS. And many times, I don't even have to read the description many times. It's just I just see the picture and I start crying, and and I also do my cleaning. Um, and it was this was comforting, and I and I felt like I was nurturing them. I was nurturing a spirit with my with my tears, and that they were. He said that in his tribe if you don't weep for your debts they will become hungry and i can understand that like wait <laughs> as i mean i wasn't meaningful for you you don't cry for me many times i have felt that from spirits um like i don't know i i i start to cry and i, and I try to hold back and they would joke like saying Okay, I don't mean anything to you. you. You can cry a few tears for me. Here he says that, well, for, for the Dagara tribe, healing is central in their lives. It's almost like everything uh, goes around healing. Like, every every day every moment of the day they are they are very aware of any part of themselves or the community that needs healing so they are always recentering themselves i've been talking a lot <laughs> i'm sorry 
Um, he says, ritual is a technology that allows the manipulation of subtle energies. Community is important because there is an understanding that human beings are, collective or are collectively oriented. The general health and well-being of an individual are connected to a community. Ritual in the indigenous world is aimed at producing healing, and the loss of such healing in the modern world might be responsible for the loss of community that we see. So ritual and community, they go hand in hand. They see that the losing ritual, you, you lose healing and then you lose community. I also read the books of um, Elder Malidoma's wife, Sombofu Somme, but I want to talk about that in another video. <clears throat> Another long quote. To ritualize life, we need to learn how to invoke the spirits or things spiritual into our ceremonies. This means being able to pray out loud alone. Invocations suggest that we accept the fact that we ourselves don't know how to make things happen the way they should. And thus, we seek strength from the spirits or a spirit by recognizing and embracing our weakness. This way, before getting us started with any aspect of our lives, travel project meeting, we first bring the task at hand to the attention of the gods or God or allies in the other world. By ritually putting what we do in the hands of the gods, we make it possible for things to be done better, because more than we are involved in its getting done. Also, willingness to surrender the credit of our accomplishment to spirits put us in greater alignment with the universe. And again, this again this reminds me to the cleaning of the Hoponopono process. Um, So we, we can start our day cleaning uh, any event, any project, any travel we do, we clean. Because we don't know what we're cleaning. Uh, and that's what we're saying. We are saying to divinity, I don't know how this should be. Uh, before making a session with a client, for example, I would, I would make a prayer and I would clean about my thoughts about the client and about the session and I would and I never had a, a, a exact idea of what would happen in the session. And I would, I would say that to divinity. I don't know what I'm supposed to do for this person. I'm, I don't know what's going to come through. So I leave it in your hands. Um, so it can be the best for, for my client and the best for myself and the best for, for a spirit. <coughs> A person's life is ritualized, who accepts the fact that everything he or she does in the work of the hands of the divine. Everyone can do this. Anyone can, before going out in the morning, send a little prayer to the ancestors on the hills or in the river. It's private and effective. So I've been uh, exploring rituals, um, connection with my ancestors. Um, when I began, well, the, the previous video I made, I was talking about Dr. Ihala Kala Hulen, which was one of the self-identity through Ho'oponopono instructors. And I mentioned how four months later, I start cleaning and four months later I start channeling and the first one I connected with were my relatives, my dead relatives and then my ancestors. Uh, there is this thing that um, some ancestors will come with their 
with their baggage. If, and this is something I already knew about because of my work with uh, the wild ones. Um, if there's anything, any healing they, they weren't able to, to accomplish, I don't know if you can accomplish healing, but um, let's say if they have wounds, you will feel them. Um, it's the memories uh, that, we sh that we share. Um, some people, they would, like, they would only call for their benevolent ancestors. In the same way that people would only call for benevolent spirits and so on. Um, in, in my work, <clears throat> I'm not sure what is benevolent. <laughs> what is the idea we have about good or bad or benevolent or not? Um, because of my work with the wild ones, many times what we think is bad or unethical or um, um, we, we are talking from our perspective, from our culture, from our own ethics and it might prevent us from from experiencing something that we are supposed to experience or from having the support we we are supposed to have in the moment. I'm not sure what I want to say here. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't suggest to discriminate your own ancestors. I would suggest if when you're working with your connecting with your ancestors, is there anything that upsets us, trigger us, or make us feel uncomfortable? Um, so maybe there are some lines that we need to to draw. Um, maybe that specific ancestor is not supposed to guide us in that moment, and we must be clear about that. But also, it's a very good opportunity to clean our own our memories. Um, there's many memories of pain, of scarcity, of lack, of abuse, war, uh, and they are, they might be giving us that opportunity to let go of those memories. And if if we miss that opportunity, uh, I think that would be sad. Um, and about offerings, um, there's no, I, I will send this to another person, there is no rules and there is no, uh, there's n not such a cookbook, you know, there is no a specific r recipe that you should repeat over and over. You enter into this sacred space and you follow inspiration. <laughs> you never know if you're truly following inspiration or you're just repeating memories. In my case, I keep cleaning along the way. I do things, I feel I should do this, I should bring this. Should I? Is this what I really need? Well, let's clean about it. <laughs> um, so I say thank you to any item I have gathered and I'm about to offer to ancestors. A very uh, basic thing is um, to offer, like, you have uh, guests, uh, you bring them cook, you bring them food, you cook for them, or you bring them food or something to drink, and the same with the ancestors. Um, for me, one of the the simplest things to do is like, and I'm beginning to do that more. If I make um, a cup of cacao for me, I make a cup of cacao for them. 
Uh, the same with tea, if I make a cup of tea for me, I make a cup of tea for them. Um, I also, I'm also working with the spirits of nature that well, we could say are the same. <laughs> um, so sometimes I have these little cups and I have them in my garden with cacao. And you leave them overnight and you can clean uh, the day after. Um, I've always um, been fascinated by the heritage of the Keros, that are uh, indigenous from Peru, that are kind of famous <laughs> with in between the spiritual among the spiritual community. Um, they do these despachos, they are offerings uh, for the for the earth. And the the shamans would do them every day, and anything they do, they would they would make an offering first. And if, for example, if they have to if they have to reach a sacred mountain along the path, they will stop uh, many times to make an offering in every in every part. And if there is anything special happening, they will make a special offering for that. So at first I would do dispatches only like in the equinox and solstice and I started doing in the full moon and new moon and now I do them whenever I feel like and it's just I just gather seeds food um and you can you can become creative you can become creative so this is specifically for the earth but uh, you can do specifically for the ancestors, for nature. Um, again, follow your inspiration. Someone f will feel more comfortable or they will feel called to, to make these offerings for the earth and others will really connect with the ancestors and they will make offerings according to their lineage, um, like the culture their ancestors were living on, they will make that kind of food, the food they used to eat. And also it's the same. Um, you can cook uh, the meal, the, the favorite meal of your grandfather. You can offer them the, the drinks that they used to drink. Um, you can light a candle for them in their name. Um, most of all, I think it's very beautiful to sing for them. This is something I did. Well, I offered them like language, but I'm, I'm working closely with my mother and there is a lot of memories that need healing there. Um, and I felt very, that there was a lot of things moving when I sang for her. Um, so I think that's, that's something that will nurture them very much. And if you're singing, you'll get emotional. That's also a, a very beautiful opportunity to, to clean about it. Um, and just saying, thank you. And I love you. Those are very powerful cleaning tools. Okay, so this video <laughs> is longer than I thought and I barely have light now, so I will wrap it up. Thank you if you stay this long. <laughs> Thank you for listening and I wish you, your relatives and ancestors, peace beyond all understanding. And enjoy a beautiful connection with nature, with your community, with your ancestors. And again, there's no guidelines, follow inspiration. Let divinity guide you. Thank you.